There's no one in our team thinking score a winning goal. No one can be. Yeah. You know, you just scored a goal, your relief is, is enormous. And then the second goal goes in and literally I'm planked on the floor on my back. Literally, I think I actually nearly went into tears. My first ever experience was actually arriving at the team hotel for my debut. I don't even remember the first training session, but I remember being involved in the squad before Torpedo Moscow, which was my debut at the age of 17. And I remember turning up at the hotel. And I remember it was the Midland in Manchester. And the Midland in Manchester is a grand old building, one of the oldest hotels in Manchester, probably the most famous. And thinking, I've never stayed in a hotel like this in my life, ever. Yeah. You know, I, you know, we've been to well, Tenerife on holiday or Blackpool or Fleetwood and stayed in caravans on holidays. And literally to go to the Midland Hotel, I thought, oh, this is a bit posh. And I was sharing with Chris Casper, who I was in the youth team with. And then he told me I was going to be sub. And I, I couldn't believe it that I was going to be sub. And my mum and dad were coming to the match. And I remember warming up thinking he's not going to put me on. And he put me on with three minutes to go. And I touched the ball once, it was a throwing. Sort of epitomises my career. <laughs> My career continued on that path of sort of <laughs> inactive average. <laughs> uh, but it, it, was, it was the most incredible experience. I always remember get, my dad getting quite emotional on the way home. And to this day, I always say it was the most important moment in my life. When Sir Alex Ferguson speaks to you and there's, not the, there's none of these like sort of great speeches. This is what it's going to be like to play for Manchester United tonight. This, it's very understated when you're breaking into the team. You know, I'm going to put you on the bench tonight, son. And then you'll go, is that okay? I'll go. Yeah, thanks. And that's it. You know, it's not like this sort of major monumental moment. He wouldn't play it up. He wouldn't build it up so that you get more nervous. You know, I remember my brother played his first game in the Manchester Derby. And you didn't tell him, I don't think, till maybe the earliest was the day before, maybe on the day of the game, he even told him. Because if you told you three, four days before, you've got three or four days of nerves, of anxiety and build up and what's going to happen. So he always left it quite late, understated, and made it very normal like any other game of football. Were you scared on that first day when you were on the bench and you are going, I could come on like, for Manchester United? Yeah, it's different for everyone. I don't think that sort of, I don't think that feeling of, uncomfort that uncomfortable feeling left me till I was probably late into my twenties. And then in the tunnel, that adrenaline rush was always there. That feeling of you're in the tunnel, the team are there next year, you're going out and you've got to make sure you do everything you can to win that football match. You know something you say, best bit of advice, things that stick in my mind. It might be little things, constant things that were there all the time. You know, every time, you know what the hardest thing to do is when you're in a big pressurised atmosphere as a defender, is get on the ball and get us playing. Mm -hmm. You know, people say bravery is winning a tackle or jumping up for a header or making sure you win a 50-50, whatever it might be. The hardest thing to do is going away to Anfield, splitting your back four, getting your full backs wide, getting your uh, goalkeeper to give you the ball and play and try and quieten that crowd and scolds it every single time our keeper got the ball, Gaz get wide. And I always remember those words, Gaz get wide. Because I might think, well, let's just kick it forward. Let's just play up the field a little bit. Let's be pragmatic in the first part of the game. But he'd always say get wide. And that was him saying, we're going to get on the ball. We're going to play. Hmm. So that's a great bit of advice, I think, because it always was, it meant that the standards of our team were that we always played. Rio Ferdinand, before every match I played with him, said nothing down our side nothing down our side. He was right centre back, I was right back. And I wanted those words, because I knew that if anything came down our side, it was either me or him that were at fault. So nothing down our side. Because we're not giving goals away. We did give goals away, of course, we made mistakes. But those words before a game reminded me what I'm there to do. Roy Keane might say concentration, if, you make, if your first touch is bad, or if you're, you know, concentrate, you, you, you become alert. You, you step up. So it's, there's not this magical words that, you know, I said before about the boss. Mm. They're really things, principles that work for you every single day of your life that you just remember and that you abide by when you're playing. Um, yeah, that, 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 they're the things that I always remember. <music> Biggest regret. If I speak to my two daughters, it'll say definitely not scoring more goals. They think it's an absolute embarrassment <laughs> that I scored seven goals in 602 games. They can't get their head around it. Like seven goals in 602 games. Absolute shambles. Fullbacks change the position now, though, doesn't it? <laughs> it has, but I missed so many chances. I should have been braver. I should have paid more attention to it. Not saying I've ever scored 100 goals. I would never even got anywhere near it. But yeah, that, that, that's not a regret, but it's something that always gets thrown at me by my daughters. The biggest regret 
Like, is there a specific instant you, you think? England's are England, England. Never getting to a final, never winning a tournament. That's a that's a regret. It's a it's my disappointment. It's the one that thing that you know. Not saying we could have won every tournament, we certainly couldn't. But there's one or two where I think we could have performed a lot better and got into finals. And if we had that ruthless clinical edge to us, something missing. I don't know what it was, but that's the big. That's the thing that always sticks with me. With United, honestly, I couldn't have given any more at any point in any second of any day. I, I genuinely feel that. It's not bragging. It's not being arrogant. I genuinely gave my all. I, I, how can you regret if you give your all? You know. If you work as hard as you possibly can and you don't give in, then how can you have regrets? How can you have regrets? Then thinking about England there, you say like so which which of those teams that fills you with the most regret? Which of those like tournaments are they? Ninety six and two thousand four, maybe two thousand six, but two thousand four, ninety six, those two Euros. And these lads who've just lost this final to Italy on penalties who were absolutely outstanding, it will live with them forever. Honestly, losing a penalty shootout in the semi-final, final like they have, which is an unbelievable achievement. I haven't got a bad word to say about them. Well done to them. And they're a great team. They will, it will live with them. Honestly, it will live with them. They'll, they'll always have that feeling. After something like that, what's the squad, what's it like in that dressing room when, when you've gone through or just been that close to being a final? It's like, what's the dressing room like after an event like that? Solemn. Mm. Yeah, I mean, players in tears. I, I never cried after a game of football. Never cried after a game of football in my life. I still don't now. It's a horrible feeling to walk off that pitch knowing that that two years of work that you've put in, all those fans that have travelled are in that stadium and there's always tens of thousands of them wherever we are. They're all going home devastated and you're into that dressing room and you've got to go back to your team hotel and pack your bag and you've got to leave each other having been together for a month like a family. And it's a horrible feeling. Mm. It's a horrible feeling. Packing that bag after you've been knocked out, particularly if it's a disappointing one, and there were some of them, is a brutal feeling. You know, and I experienced it a lot. What's the moment that you look back on with the most, like, that fills you with the most joy? Barcelona, probably last minute. You know, to win the European Cup um, after so long, it was the boss's dream. Uh, it was our dream. Um, but to win the treble, to win the league, the FA Cup and the Champions League in 10 days. And the way we won it, I think it epitomised how I see a Manchester United player, a Manchester United team. You just fight to the absolute death. You do everything to win. I don't care what it is, you have to try and win every, at every cost. And that team just went and went and never stopped. Never stopped. It was it was brick hard, that team. So let's, let's, let's put Put us in your shoes that night in Barcelona when it happened. When the moment, so when when we when I'm a United fan too, but when you know equalise, you're on the pitch still. You're, you're, are you still you're still on, aren't you? At that point. Yeah. Can you remember when you see we did, did Michael go up? Were you in the box for the cross from? No. So I, I don't know if you remember. I ended up on the left wing. Right. To get the, I, I put a long throwing in. It ball got played back out and it got played over to me and I played a cross into the box and it got deflected out for the corner. So I then went back, I was on the left wing, just yeah. I ran over there, sprinted over there just to sort of take the long throw, which sometimes I would do in desperation when we needed to win a game and I had the long throw in the team, so just get it in the box. Um, and then from that, I knew I was the one back. Me and Dennis were always back on the halfway line. The one thing I remember in that game, and I played in the new Camp before, but I'd never recognised it, obviously, with being so full of Manchester United fans at that end that, that we were sort of kicking towards. And the Bayern Munich fans were behind us here. But I, I thought, all oh, those people, and I remember thinking this in the game, sometimes I, this, these things would happen to me, where I'd think, you know, the, I, was, I was aware of the crowd. Sometimes you're not, you're just in a game, but I sometimes was aware of the crowd. I felt the crowd were part of the entertainment. I always clapped them before a game, I always clapped them after a game, every single time. I was thinking, they've not celebrated, they've not even seen a goal, and I'm gonna have to go over there and clap them at the end, and they're all gonna go home. And then that goal went in, and they just all went absolutely mad. And I don't know how many were, there were there, about 40,000 of them. And I thought, right, and you start getting goosebumps, and you think something's happening, and then you're thinking extra time. You're thinking, right, let's get to extra time. There's no one in our team thinking, score a winning goal. No one can be. Yeah. You know, you've just scored a goal, your relief is, is enormous. And then the second goal goes in, and literally I'm planked on the floor on my back. Literally, I think I actually nearly went into tears. 
I was emotional, I was screaming, and to be fair, even now I feel quite emotional about it, because I, I just thought, oh my God, what have you lot just done? You know what I mean, what have you lot just done? My first words to Ollie, you have no idea what you've just done. Honestly, you've just created history in that moment. And I remember sort of just lying on the floor and not getting up. And you'll never see me in any celebration in that far corner when they're all, I'm literally on the halfway line, so I'm back for the corner, on the floor, lying back like that, looking up to the sky. And I'm not religious, I don't go to church, but I'm just looking up thinking, what has just happened? It was like mind blowing. And can you remember what happens next? Did you get picked up by someone and told, we've got to play, got to finish the game? I, th I, think the, I, I think, to be fair, I remember David Beckham coming back to the halfway line. He was on the right at this point. And I remember us just thinking, we've done it, it's it, you know, we've, it's happened. It's like in Juventus when, um, I think Coley scores that goal, that third goal. And I remember thinking, we've done it. We've, we've, you know, you got to the final and then obviously you know they're not going to come back from that. And the referee blew his whistle literally a matter of seconds after the kickoff again. And it was just, at that point, absolute mayhem. I then remember us all sitting on the pitch singing Sit Down from James, which obviously is on camera, and thinking, wow. I remember Scalzi and Keeney coming through with the suits on, absolutely bladdered. Been drinking all day, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just had to, did not they? And then I remember, the next thing I remember is walking round on my own, um, the port in Barcelona, with champagne at seven o'clock in the morning, thinking, I ain't going to bed. And it's the, I think it's the only time in my life I've never gone to bed and I couldn't go to bed. There's nothing going to get me to sleep. We were on such an adrenaline rush and it hit me about nine o'clock the next night and literally I was gone. And then I remember coming down Dean's Gate and seeing the fans and thinking I've never seen anything like this in my life. And it was the fans, it was the, it was the emotion of the fans. It was the sort of, I know, I know what Manchester United means to our fans, I know it. I lived it, I am one, but I'd never seen it like that. I always recall veins popping out of grown men's necks. You know, men and women hanging off scaffold posts and tubes and lamp posts, you know, risking, you know, injury, great injury just to see us. And the feeling of like complete and utter emotion and happiness. I never look back, but I'm looking back now, but I never look back in my life. I'm always thinking what's going head forward. But if I could live 10 days again in my life or a period in my life, again, it would just be that 10 days. Even if you gave me that 24 hours, Maybe from sort of Ollie's goal, <laughs> even to the walk, you know, walking on the beach in Barcelona. I mean, no wonder you, you get. I'm getting goosebumps. Just must be just hearing about it again. It must be such a thing to even think about that moment. And just build you with such pride. It does because it, it, it just at the time you don't realise. You, you do realise it. You, that actually one way you do realise it. Sometimes you achieve things and you don't realise it as a team. I think at that moment we realised that something was special, and you're something. For that team, it's probably never the same again. You know, the manager had to rebuild in the mid 2000s and get to 2008 with a new group of younger players. You know, Vidic, uh, Ferdinand coming, Evra, Rooney, Ronaldo, players like that. So that there was a turnover. Yeah, Scholesy was still there and, and Giggsy was still there, but it was a new team. And once you've reached that level, as much as I would always say your standards remain the same all the time, it's difficult after that one for everybody to recover from it. People think you need to recover from defeat. Sometimes a, a great victory, you need to recover from that as well. I remember teammates getting into disputes. I remember teammates coming to blows. I remember incidents of, with myself, um, at times. Who did, uh, Who did you fight with? Who did I didn't fight with, I think to be fair, once I remember Ruud van Nistelrooy at Middlesbrough away, he was fuming with me, came in after the game. I, I was already in the dressing room. I played a ball in the channel, he'd not run for it. It was probably a bad ball, but I wanted him to run after bad balls. I used to say, make a good, make a bad and a good one, you know what I mean? That was sparky. <laughs> just put it in there, I'll make it a good one. So I was like, you know, put it in there, Ruud, just run after it. You know, try and, pre try and uh, close down the defender, do something for me, don't make me look an idiot. And he wanted a better pass, which to be fair, fair I do to him as well. He didn't want it. He didn't want to go chasing down channels for, for my for my uh, agricultural uh, hikes. Uh, and yeah, just about that, it, it, you're something. I never let things continue. I never let things continue with anybody. Uh, I always got over it, and they always got over it, and I always confronted it either after the game or certainly on the Monday morning when we were back in. Do you have to get on with your teammates? Because I know there's, there's like famous examples of people like um, sharing them and Cole didn't particularly get on well or something like that there. Does that add a difficult dynamic do, in a dressing room? Do you know something? I think, no, you don't have to always get on with your teammates. And that means that in 21, 22 players in the dressing room, you know, player six might not get on with player 12. 
and that might never come to the fore and it might be something that you don't even recognise but they just don't see eye to eye, eye to eye or they don't go out with each other or they don't speak to each other that much. But for me, I always feel like I had to be able to have a conversation with every single player in the dressing room at United. I didn't want there to be any of them that I couldn't go over and speak to because I felt, I felt uncomfortable then. So the, every player that I think I played with, and look, there might be the odd one that comes out and says, well, no, he never spoke to me, but I'd be surprised. Um, there was one or two players, I'm not going to name them, that I wasn't great fans of, because I thought they were actually, I thought they were a risk to us. Our spirit, our energy. Uh, I would never comment on performance, because at the end of the day, I wasn't always great. But I just felt they weren't great in the dressing room, a couple of players. And to be fair, the manager moved them on quite quickly. They weren't with the club for long periods. Um, but. I always felt like I needed to get on with the rest of the dressing room um, because I think we were, you know, me, my brother, you know, Butty, Giggsy, we were, uh, when we were coming through in, in a period, we were sort of the ones that you could, we could have a go at them, they could have a go at us type of thing. And you need those sort of what would be, yeah, you, know, you need that sort of glue in the dressing room. And then when I got a little bit more experienced, it became Wayne Rooney and it became Patrice Evra and Rio Ferdinand. They were the energy in the dressing room because they were younger and they just had that sort of incredible spirit between them. But we could see it that we used to have that f five, six years before. And I'm sure when Sharpie and Giggsy and Incy were younger and they were coming through at United, they had that same spirit for the likes of, you know, Brucey and, and, and Robbo and Pally and them players. So your young players are always your ones in the dressing room who feel like you've got to have that energy. Um, you've got to have energy in the dressing room and you've got to have that enthusiasm and that sort of feeling that you want to come into that dressing room every single day. So yeah, I think you can have one or two that don't quite get on, but generally in a dressing room, most of you have got to be able to be tolerant of each other and accept each other. And that doesn't go in a dressing room, that goes for anything that you're doing in your life. I'm going to ask you now about like two specific incidents that people have talked about that have happened in the Mind United dressing room. And I just want to get your kind of memory of what happened and what was the outcome from it. The first one is, is Pizzagate, uh, Cesc Fabregas. Yeah. So what, the, what, can you take us through that incident where you were, like you did with the, the Champions League final earlier on, we talked about Barcelona. <sighs> Where were you and what actually happened that you remember happening? I, it just something the tunnel, at, say the tunnel at Manchester United, it wasn't the tunnel, it was the corridor to the changing rooms. It was so tight, you're talking about probably a metre wide, maybe 1.2 metres wide, you know, that. And then you've got about 20 odd people all in a corridor. And it was just a mayhem, it was just a, a load of noise, of shouting, of bawling, of um, aggro, that always used to spill over against Arsenal if there was an incident during the game, if we lost and we were upset or they lost and they were upset. I think obviously now it's, you know, it's a well-told story that I think it was Fabregas that basically threw the pizza. We used to put pizzas in the dressing room of our, obviously the away team and, and ourselves after a game. He's gone in and he's come back out, so what's happened, he started lobbing pizzas and stuff. <laughs> I mean, quite a strange thing to do, but each to their own, I'm not against it. I always felt it all was, all was fair in love and war, in football, I always felt, you know, if fans criticised me, if they sang my name in a derogatory manner, I always felt it was fair, because I would call it on with them. And I always felt that's how it should be. A football game is competitive, and it should be competitive within boundaries off the pitch, and there should be that energy and tension in a stadium that's there, a good energy and tension. And that existed between the teams. I, I was still brought up in an era, and I know it's different now, and it's right to be different, and, uh, you know, but I was brought up in an era whereby you couldn't like the opposition. Why would you? Why would I like them? Why would I shake hands with them in the dressing room? Why would I look at my brother when I'm walking out with him for his Everton captain? Why would he look at me? Why would I shake Peter Schmeichel's hand when he's gone play for Manchester City? Why would I? I see players having conversations, they're hugging each other and it's, it's wonderful. And I, I, I'm glad the game can be played in that spirit and still be as competitive mm. and, as, and compelling as it is. But that could never have happened with our dressing room. Our dressing room wasn't built like that. It, it, you couldn't. We had Sir Alex Ferguson there. You had Roy Keane as captain for the majority of my career. And you had underneath Roy Keane a group of players who were Manchester United fans in the core of the dressing room who didn't like anybody else. They didn't like anybody else. You brought up not to like anybody else. That's what you are. It's your club. Is it weird then to go from like this sort of hatred might be too strong a word, but where you don't want to, you want to beat them, you want to absolutely hammer them, to then when you retire and you become a pundit and you're starting to like, interact with these people on a different level? Yeah, I, I never thought, I wondered what it would be like, obviously, when I finished my career and I had to go and work on television with players that I'd essentially like not, Carragher, got, really not got on like with. Yeah, like... Jamie Carragher is famously. And there's no doubt that if, you know, I was at Sky for two, three years before, you know, I was doing Monday Night Football. If I had said, you know, I don't want him to come in, it may have influenced Sky at the time, but I would never do that. 
you know, I always was bigger than that, and I always would say, no, I think the, the, we've always got to have the, the best for the show, for what we're doing. We've always got to have the best for what we're doing, wherever. So if I'm at Sky now, I want the best mm -hmm. production, the best studio, I want the best pundits in there. I want us to give great entertainment. You have to. So I always think that way. And I have to say that it became quite obvious within 12 months that I was going to have to adapt and change. But all the anger left me. The second I left United, which was the second I finished my career, the anger left me. The tension left me. The, you know, if you think about me, I never smiled for 20 years on a football pitch. Mm. I never smiled. I never, I never once saw football as a joy. And yet when I left football, I could become me and I could sort of get rid of that. And am I a winner now? No, I'm not. I don't go to a, you know, any football match and think, I used to take it home with me at night. It used to ruin my week, as it all did all of us. But now if United lose, I'm disappointed and I'm annoyed. But for an hour or two that night maybe and then I wake up in the morning seeing the papers but then I've forgotten about it because I can't do anything about it. Who would you say are the top six now? If, it's, if Leicester are in there, who's, who's dropped out? Well, Liverpool are in there, United are in there, City are in there, Chelsea are in there, Tottenham and Leicester in the last few years I would say. Arsenal fans will probably like come up with some stat now that you know I mean because they think I hate them anyway. 